Mm -hmm. There we go. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So this week we're um, we really made a lot of progress on the book. We're on chapter seventeen. We've moved to the global, uh, you know, explainer type methods, and um, the one we're going to talk about this week, uh, partial dependence profiles, is a really uh, popular way to explain uh, model predictions, um, particularly from black box type type models. I use this one um, both in my personal work and then also in my uh, day to day um, work. Um, you know, uh, doing analytics for um, insurers. Um, and and just so you know, guys, uh, like I, I wasn't familiar with the term partial dependence profiles. The way I've seen it referred to in other places was partial dependence plots or PDP. So um, I think throughout this, uh, you know, uh, this, the, these uh, slides here, I'm kind of, I, I use those two terms in, um, interchangeably. Um, so just bear with me <laughs> if you see me refer to it as PDP. I, hopefully that's not, not too confusing. Um, like I said, it's a really, um, popular technique. It's been around, I think, for about 20 years, but probably wasn't a mainstream data science uh, tool um, for that for that long, of course. But um, I personally used uh, the PDP package um, to do uh, PDP plots in the, in the past. But, you know, the, the book mentions at least four packages that allow you to construct these things. Um, has anyone else use these ever in, in any work that you've done either academically or on your job or for fun i have used the pdp in a prior uh, book club they for, introduced for, them okay yeah for for book club anybody else no not, not for me okay um the the core idea of a pdp plot is is pretty intuitive um Basically, you're creating a chart that shows the relationship between your model's predictions uh, against uh, various values of a explanatory variable of interest. Um, um, technically, you can you could do this as a three-dimensional plot where you have two explanatory variables. We saw that with um, Federus Paribus plots as well. Um, but all of the examples that we looked at in this chapter are, are just based off of one explanatory uh, variable, so you can do it just a two-dimensional plot. And um, the reason why I say this is intuitive is I think you know most of us, if if we're dealing with a, a data set, the first thing you do is data exploration. And as part of that, you know what we typically do is we create bivariate plots, right? Just to see how the um, you know your your target variable, how that um, how that relates. Uh, to to just individual explanatory variables, right? That's kind of a first step just to get a, a rough sense of what's going on. And a, a PDP plot is essentially doing the same thing, except you know you're you're dealing with the model's predictions as 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 your target against uh, various uh, values for the explanatory variable. Um, it, typically, th this is produced on. Uh, all observations in your training data, uh, assuming your training data is not not too um, voluminous that you <laughs> you're, you're sitting around for hours waiting for a PDP chart to to be produced. But that's typically the the data that that's used to produce these these plots. Um, I, again, it, it helps you understand the relationship between uh, variable of interest and and the target. Um, it can also be used to compare uh, different models. Um, the example in the book, I think, talks about having a flexible model like a random forest against maybe a simpler model, say like a, a linear regression. And if the the PDP plots look similar uh, among you know those two models, that gives you confidence that that your models are doing what they they, they should be doing. Um, when the PDP plots are different, um, you know that's maybe a cause for concern. It could mean a couple things, really. Uh, one, it could mean that your, um, in, you know, your less flexible model, uh, your model with high bias, uh, like a linear regression, uh, you know, maybe is underfitting the data. It, it's not doing a good job of, of following a relationship, particularly like if there's a non-linear relationship between 
a, a variable and the target, like a linear regression won't pick that up um, unless you're explicitly putting in like squared terms, right? Or uh, tertiary, et cetera, um, terms in, in the model. Um, so, you know, if you had a random forest and a linear regression and the random forest is picking up this nonlinearity, that may suggest to you that, hey, like I, I need to, if, if I ultimately want to use the more interpretable model, I probably need to do something to capture the nonlinear relationship in my, in my linear model. Uh, the other thing that's, that's good for PDP plots and, and comparing multiple models is you can see how the model's different at the boundaries. And, and by boundaries, we kind of mean those outlier uh, values for our explanatory variables. The, the book mentions that random forests tend to not do a great job uh, when you are predicting on the boundaries of, of certain variables. They don't, it doesn't do a great job of uh, extrapolating uh, to, to values that haven't been seen much. Um, and then there are other machine learning models like support vector machines that uh, perhaps are, are, have, have very high variance at the boundaries, right? So they're maybe unstable and, and um, overfit. To, uh, to what's being seen in the, in the data. Um, so that's, these plots can be used to kind of tease that out and, and maybe find out areas where your models are not necessarily performing well. And uh, any questions so far? Okay. No, very good. So uh, next section, intuition. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we, we, we talked about ceteris paribus profiles uh, weeks ago at this point, uh, which is really an instance-based method, right, that shows you for a particular observation, if I had changed the value uh, of my, my one you know, single explanatory uh, variable up or down, how would my prediction change? Uh, you know, so a lot of the examples we would have seen would have been on like Johnny or Henry <laughs> that we've been using throughout the chapters here. Um, the PD profiles take things a step further where you're, you're really looking at a, a large sample or maybe all of the, the, the CP profiles and taking an arithmetic average of them to come up with um, you know, what, what a, a PDP value. And then from that, you can extrapolate um, a single curve from it. Uh, Couple interesting uh, features, uh, things to point out with CP profiles if you're plotting a lot of them uh, you know, on, on one graph. Um, if your model is additive, uh, like a linear regression model, then all of your individual CP profiles should be parallel. Um, whereas if your model includes a lot of interactions between the explanatory variables, then your CP profiles probably aren't going to be uh, parallel. And uh, the example in the text, uh, hopefully you can see it here. This is a random forest model, fit on the Titanic data set. Uh, on the left, um, it's, a, it's a bunch of ceteris paribus profiles. And uh, so we're, we're plotting the prediction of survival from the random forest model against age. And um, the predictions are, are, are those those CP individual CP curves are certainly not parallel, which um, would indicate that there's you know likely uh, a lot of interactions going on. Uh, so it, it's a little hard to discern a kind of signal just from looking at a graph like this. Um, I really like this chart on the left. You see there's a lot of um, dots kind of going on. And from what I understand that those represent the actual value of the explanatory variable for a given instance. Um, right, like you can extrapolate an entire curve because you're just, you know, cha changing one variable and saying, hey, if we if we use this instance, but we change the one explanatory variable to be a higher age or a lower age, here's what we get. But the the, the dots represent the true values for the um, uh, on the x-axis of of what the instance uh, um, held for for age. Um, on the the right here, we have basically the same. Uh, you know, all those CP profiles plotted. The blue uh, curve here is is truly the the partial dependence plot. It's just, you know, a, an arithmetic average of all of these um, individual curves, uh, CP curves. And um, 
one other note. Uh, I've, I've seen other literature, including the interpretable machine learning book uh, that refers to when you plot all of your ceteris paribus profiles together in one plot, that's also called ice plot. So um, just be on the lookout for that. Um, and that stands for individual conditional explanation uh, plot. Um, so the, the PDP curve is an average. If you really want to understand variation around that average, you can plot the ice plot, I guess, along with the, the, the PDP plot. Okay. Yeah, I think they use all the observations to calculate the average, but uh, they are plotting a sample of the for the lines. Yeah, I I noticed that the Dell X package by default has a hundred observations that it uses to make the plot. Um, or or or. Actually, that's a good question or good point, Angel. Uh, you're saying it uses all of the observations to do the PDP curve, but only a sample for the CP profiles? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one thing I can tell you on real life data sets, um, if you try to include an entire training sample and you have hundreds of thousands of rows or, or millions, you're going to be waiting around for a long time to construct that, that, um, that profile. And... Um, uh, so <laughs> uh, I, I can see why you'd want to use a sample. Um, you know, I, I work in insurance data where the data is highly skewed because um, I'm generally looking at cost as my, you know, outcome variable. And it, it you, you know, where you could have claimants that are many orders of magnitude higher than average. So, you know, constructing this off of like a hundred samples might give you an unrealistic view. Um, so that's, I think we'll get to that later, but that's, that's kind of a con in my mind of constructing these curves is it, it can't be time consuming, um, to use on a, on a realistic data set, unless you're, you think you can get a good, good value out of using relatively few samples. Okay. Got it. No, no, that's, that's important that, you know, the distribution of your data. Yep, exactly. Right. And so like, again, if you have a highly skewed data set, uh, you know, a hundred samples might not be enough. No, that's that. a really good point. Thanks for, for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So moving on, uh, the book was not too math heavy, just a couple uh, basic equations here. That That's, uh, I guess, more succinctly defines how, how the PDP calculation works. Um, and what this is showing you is that for an individual variable J, um, at a certain value Z, um, you basically take an expected value over the joint distribution of all explanatory uh, variables um, other than J, um, which is the, the variable of interest. Um, typically, we, we don't really know the true distribution uh, of our feature set. So we use the data that we have at hand, typically the training data set, and so the second equation is just, you know, saying you're taking um, an arithmetic average um, of, of your model predictions, you know, across all the instances, if, if, if you force the uh, variable of interest to, to equal Z in this case. Um, so it's, it's, it's really just a, a basic average. Um, again, the, the mean of the CP profiles. So it turns out that you might not want to just take the the, the mean uh, of the CP profiles, uh, particularly if um, you know you're, you're you're noticing in your ice plot or you know when you're plotting all those CP profiles that, there, that there's a lot of curves that are not parallel with each other. It could indicate that there's some heavy interactions going on, and so what you might want to do is create clusters of similar instances together and see how those vary uh, along with the, the model predictions. And so this was this was entirely new to me, even though I have been using PDP plots for years. Um, you can create uh, clusters um, and the Delix package does this uh, for you under the hood uh, using hierarchical clustering, I think at default, although the authors mentioned k-means clustering uh, as well as a way to 
group some of these um, CP profiles together. And, and, and what's happening is uh, they use, the recommendation was to use Euclidean distance between the different CP profiles um, as, as a way to um, you know, identify those observations or those profiles that, that should go together. And so this is another example from the Titanic data set. And um, I think the specification was for three clusters. Um, and, you know, it, it's a little abstract. You know, you don't necessarily know exactly how the, you'd have to do some digging in to see how the clusters were defined. But um, what you can see is there's there's very big differences um, in, in terms of how the, the model reacts based on these identified clusters. Um, you know, like the middle middle curve there, it's, I mean, there's some bumps, but it's almost like a linear decrease, whereas that bottom curve, I mean, really levels off to almost zero um, once folks hit adult age. And then the, the top curve, uh, you can see is relatively flat until, um, you know, 50 or mid 50s in age where, where the probability of survival decreases. So, um, I, I, I think the authors just drove home a really good point that you know the the, the mean itself might be misleading, uh, the the default you know classical calculation of PDP curve. So something to consider um, here is is clustering. Um, you may also have domain expertise where you know that um, certain variables interact, and I, I think the example they gave in the book, and this this would also apply to a lot of the work I do, on insurance data where you know predicted claims, for instance, would, would vary significantly by age, but also by gender, right? Um, and so what you can do in these, these uh, PDP plots is, um, you know, say we're still interested in, in the relationship between age and pr um, predicted survival, but let's group by gender. So we can look at males and females separately to see um, if there are any, any differences there. So, you know, this curve, the, the red curve would be females. That would only be constructed on female instances. And then the bottom curve would only be constructed on, on male instances. And you can see here that, you know, females have a, a very uh, different uh, projected uh, survival rate kind of across ages where it's higher. Um, and you see it doesn't, doesn't quite level off like the, the males do at an early age. It stays relatively flat. So I, I think that's really cool that all of those features are kind of baked into the DLX package and um, pretty pretty straightforward to to use. You know that uh, the grouping way reminds me the blocking method when we are using uh, Doyle, uh, like experimental design. Like okay, I know that this variable is important, and I don't want this affect the interpretation I want to, to, to point. Yeah. Yeah. That's that, um, that makes sense, Angel. Uh, so I, I got a note, uh, <laughs> I guess we're trying to get rid of the, um, the lines on the screen. I'm going to stop sharing quickly and reshare. See if we can, okay. I think that just took us to the beginning, but let me, get back to it. I think I had one more item I wanted to go over here uh, on the, the method here. Contrastive partial dependence profile. So the idea here is you're just uh, comparing, uh, you know, the, the PDP curves for multiple models. Um, the example, again, is, is it's a random forest model in green uh, against a logistic regression. And, uh, you know, what you can see is like the, the, the general shape is kind of similar between the two, but the, the, the curve is much steeper for the logistic regression. And I, I think that speaks to the earlier comment about random forests um, kind of taking average values at the boundaries. So boundaries in this case being really young ages and really old ages. Um, you know, random forests aren't good at taking those extreme values, even if, if that's really warranted. Um, and, and so we're seeing that here with like a less steep curve at those younger ages and also a less steep curve um, 
at those older ages around 60 here. Okay, so I just for fun, uh, <laughs> I um, looked at Christopher Molnar's interpretable machine learning book just for a little extra perspective on uh, partial dependence plots. And he points out that you can actually use uh, this method to do um, variable importance, which I think is really cool because we were just talking about that last week. Um, and this is an equation, this is an importance measure that he points out, it's chapter eight of, of his book, which is online free, just like the one we're reading. Um, but, but really all this equation is, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's an equation for um, variance, but it's, it's the variance of the predicted vari um, uh, sorry, it's the variance of the PDP values on the, on the plot. And so if you think of, a PDP profile that had no uh, variance, it would be a, a, a flat line, right? Like it doesn't matter how we're changing this variable, the prediction doesn't change at all. So if you have a flat curve, that would suggest that you do not have an important feature. So that's that's something to look out for. And, and this equation here just kind of quantifies that, and you know, as opposed to just qualitatively inspecting and saying, hey, my curve looks kind of flat overall, so I don't think it's important. But, um, but yeah, so this is just a more numeric way to define is, it, it, you know, am I getting a lot of variation when I, when I change the, the value of, of a particular variable? Um, he points out in, in that book that, you, you know, this can be a bit misleading if there are interactions. Um, you know, you, you could actually see a flat curve, but it's still important. <laughs> so uh, you, you probably want to do that. If, if that's a concern, you probably want to do this with, with other measures as well, like the um, permutation importance measure that we talked about uh, previously. Uh, the, the other point here is if you're doing this importance measure, it, it, it gives equal weight to every potential uh, value of the explanatory variable, which is not necessarily good either because it's this equal weighting um, uh, could produce mis misleading results in that like some of these are based off of like a single or just a couple instances, uh, whereas, you know, other values on the PDP curve could be based off of, um, um, you know, hundreds or thousands of instances. So, so there are some limitations, uh, you know, using PDP curves to do importance, but I just wanted to point that out. I thought that was cool that there's, uh, you know, multiple uses for these things. Any questions there? No, no, that's a great measure. I, I just want to emphasize that I think maybe in the prior plot, comparing the random forest versus the logistic regression, maybe the last part seems to me that the logistic regression doesn't have other option than going down, you know, do the shape of the function. Random forest can keep the the the, the value, like the probability constant. So. It's hard to know, you know, maybe, uh, if the difference in the last probability that you were mentioning was to a, a real signal or just a shape, you know, of, of the this of the logistic regression. Yeah, it's hard to say whether it's it's an underfitting or overfitting issue, right? It could be either. We just know that there are some differences happening, and I think it's uh, a reason to maybe explore more deeply. I seem to recall that the logistic regression from some of our prior conversations, like age, it's not a straight line, right? It's based off of a spline. So it is somewhat flexible. Yeah, right. you're right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. But again, we are seeing canonical uh, situations with random forests where, <laughs> you know, things look less extreme at the boundaries. So right. I, I would I, say that they are agree both, you know, they are decreasing. Yes. And they are close. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The, the general pattern is, is there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so next section is, is just examples off of the apartment prices data. We've looked at that in the past. Uh, it's using a random forest model again predicting price per square meter for an apartment. 
and we're focused on two variables, um, surface and construction year. And you know, this is the, the straight up PDP plot with, with all the CP profiles also included there. The, the cool thing here is that, you, you know, we don't see evidence of an interaction effect. Almost all of these um, individual CP plots share this, you know, a roughly similar shape there. It's a U shape uh, for, for construction year. And it's a linear decreasing kind of curve on the right with, with surface. Um, so, you know, the authors point out that I, I think there was something like quality construction prior to World War II. And so that's why you're seeing that the higher prices before, you know, roughly 1940 and then, you know, cruddier construction quality or something, uh, you know, in the years following World War II and then um, the newer, newer houses go up. So, you know, the fact that we used a random forest model here means it could pick up on those non-linearities. Um, and you're, you're seeing evidence here. And of course, if you were to just use a, a basic linear regression model with year as your only variable and, and no like um, additional like polynomial terms, it, it, it wouldn't be able to capture this. It would probably look pretty flat, I, I would think overall. Um, whereas on the right, you know, it, it looks like a linear decreasing relationship. So um, like a linear regression model would probably be able to capture this relationship pretty pretty well. Okay, uh, and then same data set, you know, the authors just show this is what you would do if you used um, clusters, um, how, how different would things uh, look and you know they specified three separate clusters here um again you know clustering is doesn't really tell you ex exactly what's what's happening behind the scenes you'd have to do some investigation to figure out how the instances are being grouped but um the shape is the same across all three clusters or you know roughly the same it's still you're st still seeing that u shape which implies you know the relationship kind of holds uh, across the board, right? So that the model predictions are pretty stable in that, you know, prices are higher pre-World War II, they go, they go down after World War II, and then they go up uh, post-2000. Um, however, you do see, like, whatever clusters are going on here, there is at least some separation in terms of the predictions. The, the overall relationship's the same, but in terms of, like, absolute value of your prediction, there's, there's some differences. If we move on to surface, uh, this would, I mean, looking at this, it tells me like maybe we shouldn't be clustering the data at all because not only does, do all those lines have roughly the same shape, but they're, they're really right on top of each other, like the, roughly the, the same values. So, um, in, in other words, I think kind of all these instances are homogenous, if you will. Um, and then finally, uh, looking at that, the grouped partially uh, partial dependence profile, um, still looking at the apartment price data set. Uh, here we're creating a, a grouping variable based on district. So it's um, different geographic areas. And um, once again, we are seeing the same shape, uh, regardless of which district uh, you're, you're talking about, uh, you know, both for surface and construction year. Um, but we do see, yes, certain areas are going to be more expensive than others. But the relationship, the general relationship with year kind of holds across districts. So I, I would argue that the kind of the, the model is pretty stable across districts um, in, in terms of how it behaves, e even though the absolute value will change. I, I really like this because it's like, even though we are using some clustering, uh, if you don't get any new insight from the clustering, it's not misleading. I would say. You're you're saying there there's there's nothing misleading from this one because of the the similar shapes here in the in the profile. Correct. No, so they yeah. are similar, and you say, oh, there is no important groups that I need to take in consideration yeah. when using this pretty variable. You know, so yeah. it's like you see it, but the you see a first place, but using the clustering also confirms that first assumption. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, and right. Um, again, if we saw different shapes there, that, that may indicate we need to do something else with our model, or we just need to be careful about, about interpreting the plot itself, right? Because, you know, looking at something on average, like a single PDP curve can be misleading because we know the relationship could, could potentially change by these different subsets. Um, yeah, there's a saying out there that statisticians use. I, 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 I'm going to screw it up, but it goes something like, you know, the, the statistician's head's in the, in the oven and his feet are in the freezer. On average, he feels just fine, right? So <laughs> the, the whole point there is like averages can be misleading, right? Um, and I, I think that holds for partial dependence profiles as well. Like if you just look at the curve itself, um, could be misleading, right? And, th and that's the whole point of trying to, to include all these additional ceteris paribus profiles in the, in the plot to understand the variation there. Okay, and then, you know, kind of following the same sequence we did with some of the Titanic stuff, uh, comparing uh, two models, the, uh, in, this, in this case, it's a linear regression model against the random forest model. And of course, it, yeah, as I uh, noted earlier, I, I couldn't remember this was the case, but it, you know, apparently this linear regression model just has year as it's, as, as one of the explanatory variables. So it's, it's a, a flat line. It does not picture, it does not pick up on the nuances, um, but the random forest does. And, you know, let's just say like you're delivering something for a client, right? And, and you want to use an interpretable model uh, because, right. Cause it's just easier to deal with. Uh, I I've had, had this in my own work where I started with a, like a random forest model, but delivered to a client, like a lasso model or a typical linear regression. Um, you know, this would suggest that, Hey, like maybe I want to use the linear regression model, but it's not doing something right here. Cause it's not picking up on the nuances for construction years. So you know, you you could again make make polynomial terms. You could have different indicator variables to to break this up, so you're picking up on on things in your linear regression model, so that it's not underfitting like it is here. Um, and then this is kind of similar to your point earlier, Angel, but this is a different data set. You know, the 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 linear relationship between surface and uh, average price prediction, it, it, you know, it, it, we're, we're still seeing the same thing uh, across both models. But once again, the random forest model um, is less steep, right? It, 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 it's assuming a, a less uh, steep slope, uh, so not as elastic um, uh, as, you, as you change the, uh, the, the surface. Uh, it doesn't have as much of an effect on uh, the, the price as the linear regression would um, would uh, arrive at, and again, this this seems to be a common issue with random forests at the uh, at the edges at those boundary boundary values. Yeah, because it seems like the the values in the boundaries are not in, important enough to uh, to move the slope, you know. Because yep. it could go, it will be less skewed, and they will fit better, you know, because it has all the possibility to do it. But the linear model set is not so important those those ages. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I we'll get into this a, a little bit later, but uh, I have had issues with PDP plots in the past where the curve makes sense to a certain extent, and then you know, you're looking at these boundary values and, and, and then like it, you know, it just, the relationship does not, <laughs> but the PDP curve is, is showing does not align with domain expertise. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that you just don't have a lot of instances that are truly at the value, you know, on the, on those boundaries. So, so that's something you need to be careful with too. Like these plots may not pick up a good signal um, at, at the, the curves. Like, I, I know that rightmost curve is, is some uh, surface, but let's just say it was age, right? Like you're not going to have a lot of people aged 120. <laughs> um, your PDP plot may produce something, 
uh, for someone that old, but it's unlikely that your training set's going to have a lot of um, data on folks that are 120 years old, unless, uh, you know, <laughs> you did a study on folks that were 120 years old. Or so older, right? basically the, the, the main, uh, the main thing that we need to learn is that for flexible mothers, having few observations of so no before on the before interpreting the result of any variable exploratory variable we need to check the distribution so it's like okay i see this pdp plot but uh, but in the other hand i have the distribution of that variable so i know if that value is frequent or it's just weird cases you know yeah yeah i think that's that's helpful and it, it could indicate that your model, right, is too too variable. It's, it's not doing a good job of, of fitting, but it, it could just be that the PDP plot is bad, right? Like, because um, again, that's, that's just taking averages, but if that's only based on two predictions and one was really bad and the average still might look a little funky too. Um, so, but I would say, yeah, you, you definitely want to pay attention to what's happening at the edges, at the, the low and high values, because... It, 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 again, it, it may indicate that your model is not behaving correctly, but it, it may also indicate that like that the PDP methodology maybe doesn't work all that well um, either uh, at at the uh, at at the ends. But that may not matter to you too. Like if if you know, it, you may not care. Like in the Titanic data set, if you had a hundred twenty year old in there, you might not care about that, right? Because there probably weren't any uh, hundred twenty year olds on the on the Titanic. Right. Okay, so pros and cons, uh, took this stuff from the textbook, just from my own experience, and then also the interpretable machine learning book. That's a uh, good reference for, for you guys. I think it's been referenced here before, but um, it's a really popular technique. Um, it, it's probably the first thing I, I learned about as far as you know, interpretable machine learning was, was how to a PDP plot. And um, yeah, so it's, it's well understood. It's used frequently in the data science community. There are a ton of packages for both R and Python, like scikit-learn, I think has some of these things baked into it. Um, it's uh, pretty easy to explain the, uh, conceptually, right? That, you know, you're just calculating an average of uh, predictions. So if you understand CP profiles, you know, it's not a, a huge leap to, to understand PDP plots. Um, and, you know, you could actually create PDP uh, plots on your own without a package. It's not complicated math. Um, so if you were somehow needed to go to another language or something like that, or do this in Excel, you, you probably could um, if you had to. Um, as I mentioned, it can also be used to do uh, variable importance, which is another strength. Um, also, um, this is in, in Christopher Molnar's book. You can you can really interpret a PDP plot. It, it's, it's like... Um, as a causal interpretation for the model. Um, so not necessarily a causal relationship in, in the, the real world, but <laughs> causal in the sense that this is how the model is viewing viewing the world, uh, right? Because you're, 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 you're um, essentially the, the, the explanatory variable of interest, you're, that's kind of like an intervention, right? And you're just uh, changing that variable up and down, seeing how the model thinks uh, you know, those small changes will influence uh, your, your outcome of interest. Um, so there's a, a causal interpretation of the model um, looking at that. Uh, there are plenty of uh, cons as well. Um, one of them being, you know, again, in this chapter, we only looked at bivariate plots. So only looking at one feature at a time, you can do a three-dimensional PDP plot as well. So you could include up to two. You know, once once you get beyond two features, it, it's hard to visualize. Uh, as we mentioned before, the PDP plot relies on the assumption of independence. So, if uh, you have a lot of highly correlated uh, features, there's interactions going on that could be problematic. You, you know, you might want to do the the grouping and the, the the clustering that was mentioned earlier to to remedy some of that issue. Um, but but these can be misleading um, if there are heavy um, interactions going on. Um, 
And then a, a similar note, this, this was in the interpretable machine learning book, just heterogeneous effects may be hidden in a PDP plot. And Molnar basically says like, well, you could actually have a flat curve uh, in your PDP plot, but in reality, if you were to separate it, you know, the PDP plots based on grouping, like grouped by gender or something, you might actually get see that there's significant um, effects going on there. It's just hidden because because there's these subgroups that are um, interacting with the the main effect that you're interested in. So um, it, it it can be misleading again if if there are it kind of relates to the whole concept of independence. Uh, Having having run these in the real world on big data sets, it can take a really long time. Even if you're not plotting all of the individual CP profiles in just the one curve, if you're running that on your entire training set and it's hundreds of thousands or millions of, of records, um, you might be waiting around. I I, um, I remember doing this a couple of years ago where I was, you know, it was taking like half hour, uh, up to an hour to, to produce one chart um, when I was using all my training examples. And I, I think I had under a million, but like somewhere in that vicinity, um, running running this in R um, in memory on my laptop. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. Uh, you might want to just use a sample um, to remedy that problem. But again, if you have a highly skewed data set, uh, that, that could be an issue as well, where you, you don't want to just use like 100, 100 samples. Uh, and then reiterating that point that I, I brought up a couple minutes ago, like, the PDP curve can be misleading in areas where um, you don't have a lot of data. So like, you know, a lot of folks aged, aged 120, like that could be, your, you might not trust your PDP curve because you don't have a lot of instances where you really have, have that um, going on. Um, one other thing I want to point out, I think that the chapter next week, maybe we'll remedy some of, some of these issues, but if, if you're looking at like housing prices and you have a couple variables like square footage and then number of bedrooms, um, and, and let's say your variable of interest is uh, square footage, well, your PD profile is still gonna use, like, like if you're interested in, in a 600 square feet home, <laughs> which is gonna be small, of course, <laughs> not, not, not very large, that's a, a pretty small apartment, but, you know, your PDP curve by default is going to use data from instances that are based on a lot of bedrooms, like nine bedrooms, right? Um, and it would be hard to cram in nine bedrooms in 600 square feet. Um, so that's that's also a shortcoming of, of a PDP plot. And, and I think next week is it ALE plots. Um, can't remember exactly what that stands for, accumulated local effects maybe. I, I think it potentially is a technique that remedies that so you don't you're not using instances that are unrealistic right for these other variables um, you're not going to have a 600 square feet home and nine bedrooms um, but 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 if you just feed things in you know uh, using the normal mechanism the normal algorithm you're going to have that could happen and and how in constructing the the PDP curve okay. I'm going to run through this last section pretty quickly because it, it is redundant other than it shows you the R code. Uh, it, it, it is the uh, Titanic data set that we've been looking at every week. Uh, the, the point here is that it's very easy to construct these in the, in the Dell X package. I think it's great. Um, the only thing it needs is an explainer object, which we've been creating, I think, almost every week. And you need to feed in which variables you want to look at. And then you just put in the plot function. And by default, you're, you're just getting the, the partial dependence profile and not the, the ice curve, if you will, all those CP profiles. Um, so, so here we're looking at random forest model, uh, pre predicted survival probability based on age. Um, there are a few other arguments to the function. Uh, one is n, which tells you like, how large your sample size is. Um, by default, it's 100. So um, these were really quick, by the way, and the, the, you know, to, to run on my computer just a second or two. Uh, but you know, if, if you were to ramp this up, uh, I think you would find uh, kind of slow runtimes. So, uh, and again, 100, 100 samples might be 
not enough if you're you have a highly skewed data set like I typically see. Um, and then you can also there are um, arguments for grouping variables. We're going to look at that uh, as I scroll down here. And then there's uh, we talked about clustering. The good news is you don't have to manually do that yourself. Uh, there is an argument k, and which basically you just specify how many clusters you're interested in under the hood. The uh, the, the, the Delix package uses hierarchical clustering. I don't know if there's an option to use k-means as well, but uh, by default, it's using hierarchical clustering. Um, and, and then if you want to add all of those CP profiles, very easy. You, it's one extra argument, geome equals profiles. Uh, again, that's also called an ice plot. You get to see all of the uh, individual instances plotted there. Here's the clustered. Uh, dependence profile. Once again, you just input the explainer, your variable, and you know, hey, I want three clusters, and um, you know, the the package does all the all the heavy lifting for you, which is which is great. And then uh, finally, I think this is the last piece in the presentation here, grouping by uh, gender. All you have to do is supply an argument in the uh, model profile function. You know, uh, say I want I want gender as well as my group, and my variable is age, and you have a couple nice curves there to look at. Oh, and I lied. Um, yeah, if you want to have multiple models together, um, you just create two separate functions for the model profile, and then use the plot function. Uh, just, you know, and as arguments, it will accept the multiple models and then it will just plot them both together on, on one plot. So it's, uh, we're talking one or two lines of code to make all of this happen, which is amazing. <laughs> I really love how the authors have uh, abstracted away all the, all the work for us. And um, I think that's it. Let me see. Yep. That's, that's all I had. Any, um, Final questions or comments about partial dependence profiles. Okay, uh, hearing none, then I guess we can uh, adjourn for the week. Um, I, real quick, I, I'll ask others, um, is, is anyone else um, interested in uh, joining another club? I know some, some folks are already doing multiple ones now. Um, I, I personally think I'm, I might be doing the advanced R uh, uh, book that, that's uh, opening up later this month. I don't know if you folks have already read that book or are interested, but just putting it out there that I, I, I might be doing that one. No, that, that's right. I, I wish I had the, the schedule. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think they're um, looking at Fridays uh, at 11 central time, so 12 Eastern. Uh, you know, so it's a, it's a weird time, but... Uh, I might be able to make that one work. We'll see. No, no, great presentation. It's really, it's really easy uh, to apply this thing with the Dallas package. Once yes. you understand the explainer, the explainer really, once you understand how to create your explainer, it opens a lot of possibilities. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I thought this, I don't know if Angel, you selected this book. I, I mean, it just, it's it's a it's a it's a really wonderful book I think for implementing this stuff in the real world. Um, I I love that other book as well, the interpretable machine learning. But you know it does not focus on the coding aspects, and I just don't really see it getting any simpler than than how these authors have have put this together. And such such a really simple you know interface for for folks to use. So it's it's nice. Can't really yeah. sing their no. praises any anymore. It's it's a really nice package. <laughs> Yeah, it's like there is no excuse to don't do this. <laughs> yes, yeah, because it's one or two lines of 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 a script, right? You don't have to think about it much. And you also have the the sample, so you don't remember something. You can just copy and paste, and and just add the sample to your case. Yes, yeah, it's very convenient, very convenient. So I think we have M. Uh, see you next week. I yep. think I will be presenting. Okay. So Sounds have, good. We're getting uh, getting kind of close, right? We have another four plus weeks. I don't know. We're getting getting kind of close to the end. Yeah, we have advanced a lot in this book.
Yep. Okay. Thanks, you guys. See you later. See you later.